Hello and welcome to today's presentation. Today we are going to look at acute coronary syndrome. Now in an outline we are going to look at uh, a review of the anatomy of the coronary arteries. Then we shall also look at the etiology and pathogenesis, go through some risk factors as well as how they present clinically in some physical examination, then how we are going to investigate and classify them into the STEMI, non-STEMI, as well as the unstable angina. Then we shall look at how to manage it immediately, then see the complications and summarize. <clears throat> so looking at the anatomy of the coronary arteries, we have two major arteries, the right and left coronary arteries, which arise from the aorta. So starting with the right coronary artery, it's uh, arises from uh, the aorta and crosses the coronary circles in front over here then uh, it moves posteriorly uh, you know uh, to form the posterior uh, descending artery which is the faded vessel over here now before i move on to describe the uh, uh, posterior descending uh, artery it is important to note that the right coronary artery may give a branch here to supply the sinoatrial node and so we are going to have the sa node artery over here now the um right coronary artery as i said uh, earlier on will branch posteriorly to form the posterior descending uh, artery to supply the posterior part of uh, the heart this um, pda uh, also uh, lies in the posterior intervent uh, you know in the posterior part of the interventricular uh, septum near the left branch of the vagus nerve now uh, sometimes this posterior descending uh, artery over here uh, may arise from the right coronary artery and sometimes also from the left coronary artery uh, sometimes it can even arise from both of uh, the right and left coronary arteries however an important um, structure over here where the descending uh, posterior descending coronary uh, artery uh, branches and go, uh, goes down it forms a T shape, uh, you know, structure over here. And right on top of this T shape structure, there is a branch of it which supplies the uh, uh, AV node. And so we are going to have the AV node artery. Now, moving on, uh, uh, let's quickly talk about the left. Um, coronary artery which moves or which arises also from the aorta and runs a short a short distance along the coronary circles for about two to three centimeters then branch into two uh, to form the left anterior coronary artery left because it is on the left anterior because it lies in the front of the heart and descending because it is descending downwards to uh, the apex uh, of uh, the heart. Then we also have the left circumflex artery, which also branch posteriorly to form this faded uh, artery over here to supply the posterior part of uh, the heart. Now uh, we also have uh, yet another branch of the circumflex artery, which uh, is the left uh, uh, circumflex, uh, which is the left marginal uh, uh, artery which supplies the left margins of the left uh, ventricle. Now, um, an important thing about these arteries uh, is that uh, we say all the coronary arteries are considered as end arteries. Why? Because uh, they supply the myocardium uh, of the heart without sufficient overlap and also anastomosis from other arteries. And so, uh, any one of them is an end artery. For example, if there is a block in this part of the uh, LAD or the left anterior descending uh, artery, if there is a block over here, then what uh, uh, occurs uh, is that all the areas downstream this artery will die off. If you look closely at this uh, branch of the LAD, you may uh, think you know it is uh, an anastomotic 
branch and so it should be able to go reversibly and supply the area but this does not happen and so a block will result in ischemic heart attack or a myocardial infarction now uh, why am i spending much time to describe the coronary artery is it important of course it is important because uh, in acute coronary syndrome any of these arteries may be occluded and uh, depending on which one is occluded there may be specific symptoms that the patient may present or signs that we may see when we examine the patient and it may also help us in our diagnosis and also in giving treatment to this patient now let's quickly move on uh, and see uh, what the definition of acute coronary syndrome is. So uh, any uh, condition which attributes to the obstruction of the coronary arteries uh, and so reduces the blood flow to the heart may cause an acute coronary syndrome. And so usually it is characterized by a sudden uh, onset of severe chest pain. And this is usually due to, you know, occlusion of the artery and this may either be a partial occlusion or a complete occlusion and we are talking in the settings of an advanced ischemic attack and in this case we may have three clinical uh, you know uh, entities we may have what we call the unstable angina we may also have the non st segment myocardial elevation or the instemi then we may also see the st elevation myocardial uh, infection we shall look into details uh, about all of these uh, entities one by one as we move on. So, what is the etiology of acute coronary syndrome? In about 95% of the cases, a ruptured plague, which is formed inside the coronary artery within the context of atherosclerosis, is responsible for the symptoms of acute coronary syndrome. Conditions such as uh, vasculitis, endocarditis, uh, also uh, the consumption of cocaine, and uh, also uh, emboli, which uh, is caused by heart valve prosthesis and you know other uh, you know paradoxical embolus or embolism, uh, may also cause uh, this. But uh, the significance in causing acute coronary syndrome is very less. And so, uh, in the diagram, I've shown. On the right, this is the heart, and as we can see, the LAD uh, is occluded over here. So uh, it is magnified also here. So as we can see, we have uh, plague buildup in the coronary artery, specifically the LAD, and so uh, this plague uh, may uh, rupture. And when this uh, plague uh, rupture. It may lead eventually to the formation of uh, uh, thrombus. And so ischemia will result from a reduced supply of blood to this part of the heart. So there's a reduced, part, a reduced supply of blood and oxygen to the myocardium. And it's usually as a result of the restriction or occlusion which has occurred over here. Now, uh, the most common cause of acute coronary uh, syndrome uh, and sudden death is, uh, you know, occlusion, which comes from a disruption of an atherosclerotic plague. And uh, we shall look into details why there's a disruption of these uh, atherosclerotic plague. And they subsequently form, you know, clots over here. And so once it ruptures over here, uh, the Red blood cells comes here, try to form clots, and these clots eventually will block the entire lumen, and so blood cannot flow to this part of the heart. And so, as you can see over here, uh, this is a dead heart tissue, uh, you know, beneath where the occlusion is. Now, more into the pathophysiology, uh, uh, we have uh, generally two main types of coronary artery lesions. Uh, the first one may be stenotic. And we may also have a non-stenotic coronary artery lesion. When we say stenotic lesion, there is always a fibrous plague which contains collagen and calcium precipitate. So these come together and causes the thickening and expansion of the coronary artery. Is it? And so uh, blood supply to uh, you know the downstream parts of the heart may be reduced 
as we can see uh, in uh, angina pectoris. And when we say angina pectoris, uh, what we mean is, uh, in, in this case, we are talking about a stable angina pectoris. Uh, we refer to that uh, chest pain or discomfort uh, that most often occurs uh, with activity or even emotional stress is usually due to what I've just explained, and uh, it may last for about uh, two to five minutes. And sometimes when the patient takes rest, this pain may go away. And so we classify it as a stable angina. Looking at the diagram on the right, this is our coronary artery. And as we can see, there is, uh, you know, accumulation of lipids, calcium, and also cellular debris. And uh, there is a thick fibrous cap over here, as you can see uh, the drawing with the blue uh, line. So the, the, the fibrous cap over here is thicker. And so uh, it makes this uh, plague much stable and, you know, may not be easily, you know, disrupted. So looking at this place, there is narrowing of the lumen. And so since it's not completely occluded, blood still passes through the remaining portion and supply the heart with blood. And so usually you are going to have, uh, you know, these uh, uh, chest pains as a stable angina. In a non-stenotic lesion, what happens is that there is a plague just like the first one. But this plague has a core of fat cells, but rather has a thin fibrous cap. And these uh, uh, thin fibrous cap frequently causes the most damage. Why? Because they don't, you know, just occlude the lumen, but they tend to rupture. And, you know, uh, once they rupture, the thrombus formation will also, you know, ensue. And once there's thrombus formation, there is subsequent occlusion of the entire vessel. And so blood supply to that part of the heart may be cut off completely. And this is usually seen in acute coronary syndrome, which may uh, result in either unstable angina or enstemming or stemming. Now, uh, looking at the diagram below over here, this is the endothelium. And as you can see, it had a very thin fibrous cap and so, you know, it was easily, uh, you know, uh, disrupted. And you can see the fat deposits down there with the red blood cells beginning to clump over here. And you can see actually some macrophages also accumulating over here. And so these uh, form uh, the occlusion and prevent blood supply to uh, the heart, leading to the myocardial uh, death. Now, this death of the myocardial cells may occur within as little as 20 minutes as a result of a prolonged ischemia. And absolute necrosis may also continue or occur within two to four hours. And so a complete rupture of the fibrous cap, as we can see uh, uh, over here, uh, may commonly you know, cause a very fetal uh, myocardial uh, infection. So uh, this is, uh, I think, enough for the pathophysiology. Let's quickly uh, move on to see our risk factors. We have both uh, non-modifiable and modifiable risk factors. Non-modifiable -mod here means uh, there's not much we can do. However, uh, we can modify uh, these non-modifiable uh, risk factors by controlling, uh, you know, their effect when we are able to reduce or make changes in, you know, in our lifestyle. So uh, that is the end. With the modifiable risk factors, it means there is actually something we can do to prevent the occurrences. So quickly uh, going through the non-modifiable ones, of course, there's nothing we can do about our age. So men uh, at the age of 65, uh, uh, you know, stand an increased uh, risk of developing acute coronary uh, syndrome in 70 years for uh, females and also uh, we have the uh, male sex uh, at much increased uh, risk of developing acute coronary syndrome when you compare it to a premenopausal woman however this uh, risk may equalize uh, when you know we compare it to a postmenopausal woman why this is because uh, estrogen which is predominant in women uh, 
is a protective factor in premenopausal women. And so it uh, kind of show them and uh, protect them from developing uh, some of these uh, acute coronary uh, syndromes. Now, uh, it is interesting to, uh, 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 to know that a recent study has even shown that with, uh, you know, uh, women who have, you know, endogenous estrogen deficiency are seven times more likely to develop acute coronary uh, disease. So this, uh, you know, goes to show how beneficial estrogen is when uh, we are talking about uh, acute coronary syndrome. Uh, we also have ethnicity playing a role over here and uh, South uh, Asians are at higher risk of developing this uh, condition, uh, but it may occur in all individuals. Then a family history of coronary artery disease uh, of uh, 55 years, less than 55 years old for men and also less than 65 years old in women, uh, you know, predispose you uh, of getting, uh, you know, uh, an acute coronary uh, syndrome. Then if you've ever had myocardial infarction before, then you may also, uh, uh, you know, uh, stand the chance or you, you still have the risk of you know, developing another myocardial uh, infarction. Quickly to the modifiable uh, risk factors, we have something like diabetes mellitus and it seriously increases our risk of developing cardiovascular disease. Even when glucose levels are under control, diabetes also uh, still increases the risk of heart disease and stroke. But uh, when the glucose level uh, is not well controlled, the risk is much higher and uh, it is uh, shown uh, that at least 68 percent of people who are uh, you know 60 less than 65 years of age and are living with diabetes may die of some form of heart disease and about 16 percent of them may die uh, from stroke so what must we do it is extremely important for you know uh, persons living with diabetes who are also overweight or who are obese to make some lifestyle modifications, uh, you know, uh, in order to bring this condition uh, under control. So we must we must eat uh, healthy uh, meals, uh, have regular physical activities, and also try to lose our weight. Now, the uh, second one we can talk about is hypertension, and um, high blood pressure increases the heart's uh, workload, causing you know the heart muscles to thicken and become stiffer. And if there is this uh, uh, thickening and stiffening uh, of the heart muscles, uh, you know, the heart cannot, cannot pump properly. And the function of the heart is to pump blood. And so if it's not pumping properly, then uh, a lot of problems, including acute coronary syndrome, may also, uh, you know, ensue. And uh, it is also, uh, it, this hypertension may also increase our risk of even developing strokes and also having some kidney uh, failure as well as some congestive uh, heart failure. And so um, when high blood pressure exists with uh, overweight and also obesity, smoking and uh, increased uh, cholesterol level, uh, you know, with also uh, diabetics, then our chances of developing, uh, you know, a heart attack or any of these acute coronary uh, syndromes is uh, very, very uh, high. Now we can also uh, talk about uh, tobacco use or cigarette smoking and uh, smokers, uh, you know, uh, risk of developing acute coronary syndrome or a heart attack is much higher than those people who do not smoke. This is because, uh, you know, cigarette smoking alone is a powerful independent risk factor for sudden cardiac uh, death in patients who are already having, you know, a coronary heart disease. So, uh, cigarette smoking, uh, you know, uh, together with other risk factors uh, may increase your risk of developing, you know, uh, you know, heart uh, attack. Interestingly over here, uh, when uh, someone smokes and you are not smoking, you are a secondary, uh, you know, uh, uh, smoker, you just inhaled, you know, whatever the person is smoking, uh, you also stand some uh, little risk of developing some, uh, you know, heart diseases. So uh, the next one we can also talk uh, about is uh, dyslipidemia or, you know, uh, high uh, 
uh, low density lipoprotein and a low high density uh, lipoprotein all of these may uh, predispose uh, an individual to uh, getting a coronary artery uh, disease because they may clog they form uh, you know uh, fat cells and clog the the coronary arteries especially the low density lipoproteins obesity has also been implicated in the uh, uh, risk factors for uh, acute uh, coronary uh, syndrome and so uh, we advise that people try to reduce uh, their weight in order uh, to you know uh, avoid some of uh, these uh, risks so leave uh, avoid a sedentary lifestyle eat nutritiously and also uh, try to reduce your weight with physical activities now uh, we, this will also go for uh, what do you call it, uh, sedentary lifestyle and physical inactivity. All of these come together to predispose us to having uh, coronary artery uh, diseases. There are other factors such as stress, also alcoholism and poor nutrition. They all play a role in the uh, risk factors or development of acute uh, coronary uh, syndrome. Now, uh, quickly, let's look at the uh, signs and symptoms and consequences of uh, acute coronary syndrome or heart attack. Typically, we are going to have chest pain, which is usually sudden in onset and severe, usually left-sided. Or sometimes it may be centrally and it may be crashing. It may also be retrosternal chest pain, usually radiating to the jaw, the neck, and also the arm. Uh, you know, usually uh, on the left. Uh, it is uh, interesting uh, to note that uh, sometimes um, some people do not uh, manifest these uh, symptoms. And we so we say we have the atypical presentation of acute coronary syndrome or heart attack. And so they have the silent MI or the silent myocardial infarction. So there's no chest pain. Mild epigastric pain may be present. So these people may have pulmonary edema, syncope, and oliguria. They may have hypotension and acute convulsional state. You see, these are not specific to acute coronary syndrome. And so we say they are atypical uh, presentations. Even diarrhea, bradycardia, and also lightheadedness are all some of the atypical uh, symptoms that uh, the person may present. And women tend to, uh, you know, usually fall into this. Women as well as uh, elderly and those people with diabetes mellitus may uh, usually uh, give these uh, atypical uh, presentations. Now, I want to specifically outline some of the specific uh, presentations in women and in men. You know, in women, uh, they may complain of uh, pressure in the chest, unusual fatigue for several days there is also sometimes anxiety and sleep disturbances they may complain of back pain neck pain and also arm pain which may radiate to the you know to the jaw they may feel nauseous and you know uh, sick to the stomach then they may complain of uh, shortness of breath these are specific characteristics for women who may be developing an acute coronary uh, syndrome. For men, they may also complain of chest pain and discomfort, uh, rapid or irregular heartbeat, and also feeling dizzy or even fainting and light lightheadedness. There may also be, you know, uh, a sudden outbreak of, uh, you know, cold sweat. They may also complain of stomach discomfort and indigestion. Then suddenly they may complain of shortness of breath. So these are uh, specific uh, uh, you know, symptoms which both men and women may present. And so the consequences of all these is uh, the chest pain which is angina may lead to abnormal uh, heart uh, rhythm which is arrhythmias which may eventually cause the myocardial infarction and this myocardial infarction or heart attack may eventually lead to a heart failure. So on physical examination, what do we see? Uh, which are the symptoms that we see on physical examination? We have uh, the uh, physical examination for the heart, also for the lungs, as well as the skin. So specifically, uh, uh, on the heart, when we examine, there may be hypotension. And if there is hypotension, it may indicate ventricular dysfunction due to myocardial ischemia. Sometimes it may also be as a result of acute uh, valvular uh, dysfunction, and so this may cause hypotension. Or, or even myocardial infarction may also cause the hypotension. Also, there can be hypertension, and uh, this may precipitate the angina or even reflect 
an elevated catecholamine levels uh, in, in the system due to the anxiety level of the patient and also exogenous stimulation of the sympathomyometrics. Uh, All of these may come together to increase the blood pressure in this patient. Then still on the heart, we may have uh, jugular venous uh, distension or congestion. We may also have, you know, uh, a systolic uh, murmur, uh, which uh, may relate uh, to the dynamic obstruction of the left ventricular uh, outflow uh, tract. We may also have, uh, or we may also hear on auscultation, uh, a third heart sound, as well as a fourth heart sound may be, uh, you know, auscultated. Now, looking at the uh, pulmonary system, we may, uh, you know, uh, find uh, pulmonary edema and other signs of left ventricular failure. This is because the left part of the heart, uh, which supplies blood to all parts of the body, uh, may be uh, ischemic and so is unable to pump very well. So blood stays in the left ventricle, then it flows back into the pulmonary veins, back into the into the lungs, and so this patient may become uh, dys dyspneic and, you know, uh, signs of left uh, heart failure may you know be uh, present we may also uh, find uh, in the lung uh, on auscultation rails and or crackles may be you know heard and this may be suggestive of left ventricular dysfunction or even uh, mitra uh, regurgitation on the skin this patient may you know uh, have uh, you know uh, diaphoresis so there may be excessive sweating uh, on the skin and so the skin may be cold and clammy uh, to touch and uh, this patient uh, when you see this in uh, such a patient you should draw your attention to the fact that the patient may be going into a cardiogenic uh, shock now i left the first one which is the levin sign and i'm going to explain uh, levin sign was named after uh, you know uh, Dr. Samuel Levin, who was an American cardiologist. And uh, this man observed that uh, all patients who had myocardial infarction or heart attack used to form a, a clenched fist and, you know, held it on, you know, their chest to describe that kind of pain they were going through. And so, uh, you know, we just saw it and, you know, uh, it became a sign. And it's actually 76 to 86 percent specific in the diagnosis of uh, myocardial infarction and so this is a typical example of someone who is having uh, myocardial infarction and that's how the Levin sign uh, look like now uh, upon seeing this sometimes you may get confused you know not all chest pains are cardiovascular in origin and so we need to be able to differentiate between the complaints of chest pain so quickly let's uh, go through this uh, these are not exhaustive i just uh, picked three or four of them just to uh, explain and so when uh, we look at the cardiovascular system and uh, we pick uh, with the cardiovascular system when we pick uh, we are going to have uh, what we call it uh, pericarditis and if the pain is uh, pericarditis. How is it going to uh, present? Usually, uh, the the pain may occur uh, as a result uh, of when the patient lies down, you know, and you know the pain may be uh, pleuritic and may be sharp. So the pain is usually positional. When the patient changes the position, the pain may go down or may even uh, uh, come up. We may also have it uh, in myocarditis. So if the patient uh, is having myocarditis, uh, this pain is usually chronic uh, in nature. It is uh, vague and, you know, it is mild and usually accompanied with, um, with fever. It may also be uh, Prince Metal's angina or a stable uh, angina. And in this case, uh, the, pa the pain may be, you know, a, a substernal chest pain. And if the person rests, this pain may go uh, away. Yeah, and sometimes also it may uh, be uh, aortic dissection. And if it is uh, aortic dissection, the pain may, you know, be rather tearing. It may be tearing as compared to the one uh, which is tightening that uh, we can see. On the pulmonary uh, system, we may uh, uh, find pneumothorax. Uh, 
how do you differentiate between pneumothorax and uh, acute coronary syndrome or myocardial infarction? If it is pneumothorax, usually the pain is sudden. Uh, when you auscultate, there may be absent breath sounds on the side which is affected. The patient may be hypoxic. And also, uh, usually, there may be a history of rib fracture or even a penetrating you know, uh, chest wound uh, may be present. And so, this is how you can differentiate between pneumothorax and myocardial infarction. Sometimes also, uh, pneumonia may cause uh, chest pain. And if it is pneumonia, uh, you are going to auscultate uh, uh, and you find uh, crackles or rails. And there may be fever and also leukocytosis uh, may be present. And also, it may be, uh, what do you call it, a pulmonary embolism. And if the pain is pulmonary embolism, it is also sudden in nature. And this pain may increase with respiration. There may be hypoxia, and the patient may also be dyspneic. And usually, if you, if you examine the patient very well, there may be calf uh, swelling you know, uh, in these uh, patients. Then with the gastrointestinal uh, tract, we may have uh, esophagitis from gastric esophageal reflux uh, disease. And if it is gastric esophageal reflux disease, usually the pain will occur one to two hours after the patient has finished eating. And usually when you give antacids, this pain may, you know, uh, subside. And the pain is rather, you know, a burning sensation as compared to, you know, that tightness of the chest, which may be radiating. And also the patient may even be vomiting. Yeah. Then we may also uh, have uh, a diffuse uh, oesophagia spasm. And if it is a diffuse oesophagia spasm, uh, you know, uh, physical examination will not help. So uh, the patient may give history uh, of dysphagia and also uh, regurgitation. Usually on an ECG, uh, this patient may have a normal, uh, you know, ECG. And when you give uh, this patient uh, nitroglycerides, you see that the pain may, you know, go off at all. Then also we may have uh, what do you call it, uh, oesophageal rupture being another, uh, you know, uh, differential in myocardial infarction. Uh, I didn't add this, but there can also be peptic ulcer disease as part of the differential diagnosis. And if it is peptic ulcer disease, the pain may be epigastrum in nature. And if you ask the history of the patient, there may be a history of intake of some insects such as aspirin. And uh, this patient may be bloating or, or may be belching. It can also uh, be from cholecystitis. And as we know, cholecystitis, the pain is, you know, localized in the right epigastrum. Right, sorry, in the right upper quadrant and sometimes in the epigastrum. And uh, if you uh, do your examination very well, you can use the four Fs, which is, is the person fat? Is the person a female? Uh, is the person fertile? And how old is the patient? Is the patient 40? So we use the four Fs in ruling out uh, these uh, 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 cholecystitis. And also you can use uh, a positive uh, Murphy's sign to differentiate between uh, acute cholecystitis and also myocardial infarction. Then on the musculoskeletal system, we may have, uh, you know, uh, musculoskeletal chest pain and also costochondritis. In costochondritis, there is, uh, you know, uh, the pain is specific. So there is, uh, the patient is able to, uh, uh, you know, point to the exact place where the, you know, the tendon is. So there is point tenderness, meaning the patient will pinpoint to the exact location of the pain as compared to a cardiovascular pain where the pain may be uh, diffused.